Well, as we explained to you last week, what we are attempting to do in this series of classes is to give the student of philosophy and comparative religion a working basis on the level of history. Actually, we realize that history is not only the account of the circumstances set up by human ideas, it is also the continuous record of cause and effect and the inevitable outworkings of policies, some of them long established. This evening we are to deal with that phase of the cycle of the Phoenix, which centers around the sixth century of the Christian era. And because this is a very important and critical period, and because it is enveloped in the general darkness, which we call the Dark Ages, there are several points that we want to go into at some length. We have a common term, the Dark Ages. And semantically speaking, we sometimes misunderstand the meaning of that term. The Dark Ages were not centuries in which nothing happened. During these long and difficult generations, a great deal of history was made, and many foundations were established for things that were to come later. The Dark Ages has two meanings as a term in daily usage. First to the historian, it means a period in which historical records are inadequate, in which various circumstances either conspired against the preservation of records or the confusion of the human mind seems to have left few concise or consecutive reports. The second meaning of the term comes from our comparison between classical learning and the condition of a people during the 6th century AD. The classical world had collapsed. Arts and sciences were certainly not flourishing. Literature was not progressing. Science was comparatively at a standstill. Therefore, the term Dark Ages also can mean non-productive years. Not years in which nothing happened, but years in which the individual and the collective were both so concerned with the immediate but nothing resembling a long-range perspective, a general, broad, enduring policy, may be said to have been revealed. The Dark Ages, according to one English historian, should be regarded as punctuated by a few outstanding individuals who are remembered as persons. We will mention these as we proceed, or some of them. But in general, we may say that literacy declined, that the human mind perhaps became too absorbed in the simple problem of survival, the physical survival of the individual in the midst of an exceedingly involved period, we might almost say, of materialism. <laughs> Not the kind of materialism that we know, but a materialism due to focusing of attention merely upon certain values, uh, to the ignoring of other values of greater, perhaps uh, permanent significance. So let us try to orient this uh, particular uh, period a little more clearly in our minds. The Western Roman Empire had fallen. This was a very important consideration. For somewhat earlier, Christianity 
had allied itself with the Roman Empire. It was the conversion of Constantine the Great, and later through the powerful activities of Justinian I. As a result of these men, Christianity became more or less so identified with Rome that the fate of Rome <coughs> heavily influenced the fate of the young religion. With the collapse of the Western Empire, Rome took its stronghold in the East, creating a splendid court at Byzantium. And we have the rise of the Byzantine emperors. The most important to us at the moment, perhaps, of these emperors was Justinian I. The casting away of the European Roman Empire left a very sad and dismal vacuum. Uh, the coming in of the Teutonic tribes, the Goths, the Huns, the Ostrogoths, these tribes conquered Rome, pillaged Rome, and did everything possible to reduce the economic status of Rome. Strangely enough, however, these foreign peoples made very little effort to rule Rome. About all that we can say that the Teutonic invasions accomplished in the cultural life of Rome was to make a thin level or layer of Teutonic concept and philosophy which was imposed upon the Latin Roman mind. Rome itself, the average citizen, probably hardly realized that the Teutonic peoples had come into possession of the empire, the Western Empire. They lived as before, their internal government was as before. But of course they had received something from which very few proud peoples ever recover, a crushing defeat. A defeat which also could never be avenged because circumstances never permitted the restoration of the Western Empire. Thus we have an important psychological factor. Rome was the foundation of Western civilization. Roman procedure, Roman thought, Roman government extended itself throughout most of Europe. And under the pressure and strength of the Roman position, a credo, a code, came into existence which may be termed the Roman code. It was the Roman way of doing things. And of course, when anyone is successful, the way he does things becomes important. So nearly all other peoples followed Rome, just as today, or at least up to recently, most nations of the world were influenced by our American way of life, and particularly by our motion pictures, and attempted to copy our styles and our fashions. We were a success. People copy success. Rome was a success. And most of the colonized areas became um, more or less competitive in their effort to be like Rome. Then Rome fell. And the great pattern, the way of life, was lost and destroyed. Now some of the circumstances also had a part in this. Justinian, uh, just prior to the time when the phoenix was again to spread its wings over Europe, Justinian closed the Greek schools. In other words, he took away from the prestige of the Eastern Empire, and to a degree this prestige extended over the remnants of what we term the Western Empire. He took away prestige from learning. He closed the academies. He forbade the Greek scholars to continue their teaching. In this way, playing strongly to the strong prejudices of the day in favor of the rise of early Christianity. Justinian undoubtedly was under great pressure. And the code Justinian, which he created, had other important consequences. In the first place, he removed certain military influence over civil law, which became quite important. But more than this, he gave additional influence to the church in the administration of civil law. Thus he began something which established a precedent and placed a wedge which was later to be widened and to be forced into a, a very large situation by Pope Gregory the Great. Justinian made it possible for the hero pope to appear. 
He set a situation in which it, it was possible for the Roman Empire, the Western Empire, to gradually escape from the Teutonic influence and become a vassal of the church. Thus at this critical point we see the beginning of what we may term the Holy Roman Empire. The Roman Empire under the control of a series of powerful and brilliant popes who stepped in to take the place of Caesar, who became like Caesar the Pontifex Maximus, or the great bridge keeper, and gradually the Western Empire uh, became the Holy Roman Empire. This, uh, in, accompanied by broad evangelical programs, missionaries sent to nearly all of the more distant European areas, gradually also resulted in the conversion of the Teutonic peoples. And these, in turn, later were to play a part in the rise of the Holy Roman Empire. But with the conversion of the Teutons and the Franks and several other groups, the Britons, we find the way, the way prepared for the rise of Charlemagne, King of the Franks and Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. This combination of circumstances also constituted a major change in the political life of Europe, the social life of Europe. Now, while all these things were happening in this area, we might mention something else, namely that the Holy Roman Empire inherited one of the bitterest feuds of all time. And this was the feud between the Roman and the Persian. For centuries, Rome had exhausted its treasuries and exhausted its manpower, trying to protect its eastern provinces from the Persians. Now, the Persians gained gradual victories and did ultimately bring the Roman Empire to a most embarrassing and humiliating position. But this uh, peculiar circumstance was to have much more importance with the rise of Islam. For Islam became seated, so to say, in the area of the old Persian Empire. And what the uh, Persians and the Romans had fought out for, century, for centuries later became the burden of the Holy Roman Empire fighting Islam. The general territorial areas were not especially different. Now, at this same time, the rest of the world was not simply dead. In our thinking, we very seldom get outside of the Europe and the Near East in these areas, or these eras, which we call the beginning of the Dark Ages. Actually, many things were happening in other places. And we may say that, broadly speaking, civilization moved out of Europe. That was one of the, the major uh, facts we have to face. We say that civilization moved out of Europe for several reasons. When Justinian closed the academies and made it impossible for non-Christian scholars, scholars to function in the Roman Empire, they immediately moved into Arabia, attached themselves to the court of the Caliphs of Baghdad, and there found a new flowering of literature and art and learning and liberalism. They found to their delight that they had come upon a group of people who really wanted to learn. Thus, a great deal of classical learning moved out of Christendom, moved out of Europe, to these outlying areas beyond the power of the Christian church to prevent their function. About this time, the church was in itself in uh, more or less of a confusion. A series of councils, beginning with Nicaea and ending with Constantinople, uh, broke the church into a great many schismatic groups. The Eastern Church departed utterly and never again was united with the Western Church. At the same time, the heresies of various kinds, and these heretics were for the most part brilliant people, these heresies were anathematized, the heretics were excommunicated, uh, and had they not rapidly departed, they probably would ultimately have uh, met the supreme penalty for heresy, and that was death. One of the groups that departed in these early days was of course the Nestorians, taking some of the very finest parts of Christian philosophy into the Near East and finally into the Far East as far as India and China. This departure of liberals 
this uh, gradual breaking within the church between liberalism and the conservative group also had its effect upon this critical period. A great change was in the offing, and the circumstances were building toward it with tremendous intensity. About this same time, perhaps a little earlier, but leading into the same pattern, was the tremendous expansion of Buddhism in Asia. <clears throat> Buddhism, strangely enough, did not expand as much within the boundaries of its original area, India, as it did in surrounding regions. But from the 4th to the 6th centuries AD, we find the great migration of Buddhistic thought reaching out and gradually coming into a powerful uh, position of authority in dominating Asiatic thinking. It was not a despotic authority, but it was a very powerful, modifying influence. One thing, it moved a center of learning into the East. For the Buddhist was to Asia what the Greek had been uh, to the classical civilizations of uh, Europe and the Near East. So the Buddhist was an educationalist, primarily. He was not only a missionary, but he was a scholar. He desired not only to bring his doctrine, but useful arts and sciences. And wherever he went, he carried not only uh, the scriptures, the Tripitaka, the great books of the law, but he also brought information about weaving, about medicine, about agriculture. He was concerned with almost every practical problem of people. This meant a sudden and rapid improvement in the way of life of many Asiatic nations. It's interesting to realize that around between 4 and 500 AD, which is getting perilously close to our period, Buddhism made one of its most profound scientific pronouncements. For at that time, Buddhism, Buddhist scholars declared the earth to be round, declared it to be a solid body in space, and declared that the space around us contained numerous and countless other bodies of a similar kind also suitable to be inhabited by living persons. Now this was something almost unbelievable at that time and gives us a little idea of the level of the thinking of these people. At this time also we find Buddhism moving into education and the rise of the great University of Nalanda, one of the most important schools in Asia. A university with a student body of over 25,000 students. The largest university in the world at its time. Much greater than anything that had up to that time been created in Greece or Rome. This university, among other things, taught Christianity and comparative religion. Something that's also very difficult for us to imagine. Scholars graduating from Nalanda created a tremendous stir in Asia and uh, for the first time accomplished something that was not to come to Europe for many centuries, namely what might be termed a literate clergy. This was something that Christianity still had to wrestle with, because it was been some time yet before Charlemagne and other leaders began to create cloister schools in Europe. But the educating priest in India, the Buddhist priest, with his textbooks, with his scientific instruments, uh, with his generally tolerant perspective toward learning uh, became quite a force. And of course one of the University of Nalanda graduates, the great uh, Brahmanic scholar, Padma Sambhava, later opened Tibet. This uh, era was, com was quite an important one in Asiatic thinking. It was leading toward the rise of a power in Asia. And this Buddhist influence was to continue till about the 12th century when it was overthrown almost completely in India and, and, and most of the areas around India by the rise of Islamism. Now let us take another area. What was happening in the Western Hemisphere at this time? We know that the old empire of the Mayas of Central America uh, was in the 6th century AD, perhaps, one of the most cultured areas on earth. We know that at this time, these people on the Western Hemisphere had achieved to a skill in architecture, which raised them almost <coughs> to the level of the great uh, Vitruvian academies of Rome and classed them with the pyramid builders of Egypt. 
We know also that they had mastered astronomy and had perfected the most perfect calendar ever devised by man. So perfect that the Spaniards copied it when they conquered the area because it was more accurate than the, than the uh, Julian calendar or the Gregorian. The Maya calendar is probably the only one of its kind in which you can take any date back a million years and find the day of the week it fell on instantly. So this, uh, this calendar, which was a very highly perfected thing, depended upon an advanced knowledge of astronomy. And these people possessed this also. They possessed an unusual scientific skill in many fields and departments of learning. They had uh, mastered many materials and substances which we later were to use and adopt from them. They also had a very well-developed socialized state in which poverty was practically impossible. And uh, as Stuart Chase points out, while Europe was engaged in this terrible confusion, which we call the period from the 5th to the 10th centuries, these peoples maintained the world's record for peace. For in the Maya Empire, there was no war for 500 years, which is the longest peace record held by man. All these things let us know that things are happening all around the world. And this is uh, a very critical and important uh, uh, section of our thinking. So let us survey just for a moment, bring up to date, the general state of things when a very important event occurred. We know that Europe was in the doldrums, that is about the best we can say for it. Communication was practically gone. Transportation comparatively unknown. Europe at that time was ruled over by a group of rulers who could not sign their own names nor read an official document. Uh, we know also that in this period, the older school which had for a great degree, to a great degree, dominated thinking and had been the opinion maker, was gone. That the Byzantine Empire was far away from Europe, too far away to be of any vital assistance, and that Byzantium also was fighting desperately against the inevitable and trying to bribe its way out of the confusions with the Persian Empire. During this same period, as far as we are able to learn, there are only a few forces operating uh, that give us any ground for optimism. One of these forces was Gregory the Great. He was gradually binding together uh, the political power of the early church. Perhaps this was an inevitable circumstance. Sometimes we think that uh, Gregory wrested this power violently from some other strong and powerful group. This is not true. He gathered up the remnants of a power which no longer existed. He did not overthrow anyone else. He sought in the dust for what was left. And having, uh, and having recognized a great and definite need, he stepped in and began to unite Christendom. He began to recognize the importance of leadership in Europe. No one else was leading. They were not able to uh, unite on any problem or on any subject. Uh, they were, to a degree, struggling violently to maintain isolated position, uh, which had previously been protected for them by Rome. This protection was gone, and the little kings and princes found themselves in constant warfare in their own areas. One thing, however, had been gradually happening, and that was the conversion of these peoples to Christianity. Thus, this absolutely scattered mass of humanity, which had lost the uh, power to worship the eagles and standards of the Caesars, had only one common denominator, and that was the rising power of Christianity. And this rising power, Gregory took hold of, and he found that he had discovered at least one point of cohesion. And on this point of cohesion, he built he built strenuously, he built thunderingly. He tossed around in his ecclesiastical powers with great freedom. But he did accomplish one thing. He took a leaderless and headless people and bound them together around the power of the bishops of Rome. Thus, out of this situation, there arose what has been called the later Roman Empire an empire which gained central cohesion 
never again attempting conquest by arms, but attempting conquest by the cross, sending missionaries to practically all belligerent peoples, fighting for their conversion, and using whatever tactics were necessary, all of which were not entirely ethical. But the problem appeared to be the great need for strength some way of preventing the entire European pattern from falling completely into nothing. And th that was where this particular uh, emergency produced certainly a strong and most ingenious individual. One who can be compared to the other great organizers of history, although we do not always give him uh, such prominence. All these things uh, were going along, but uh, the early church was having troubles not only within itself, but it developed a peculiar attitude. And this attitude uh, was so theologically aggressive that it uh, angered and irritated many brilliant leaders in various groups on various levels of thinking so that to a measure the church began to emerge as a persecuting agent, an agent which would either convert or destroy. And in the process of binding together the later Roman Empire, much was destroyed. Probably as many pagans died to bind together the Holy Roman Empire as the Christians died in the previous pagan Roman Empire. It was a difficult condition and everyone was moving on the grounds that the end justified the means. Many people did not agree with this, however, and there was strong division of, a, of feeling and opinion. Much of this division was out in the Arabian desert, where intellectuals, observing from a distance, themselves educated perhaps in Greek and Roman schools, students of Plato and Aristotle, mathematicians, deep in Euclid, these men observed with great misgivings of this battle for the control of Europe by the early church. And uh, their voices were raised against it. And their voices were also echoed by the heretical Christian groups that had taken refuge in these outlying areas. And in the midst of this, we, saw, we note the rise of Islam, which corresponds almost exactly with the critical years of our Phoenix cycle. In this uh, period, again, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. The general failure throughout the area of certain values produced out of its own emergency the kind of individual who so often arises under such conditions. In this case, Mohammed. Mohammed's life has been written by probably three or four hundred different authors. One of the most uh, interesting, detailed accounts is given by Carlyle. Mohammed was a man of unknown background, comparatively limited opportunity, living in a comparatively unimportant area from the standpoint of world thought. Mohammed's rise in Arabia was as phenomenal as the rise of Jesus in Jerusalem. It was not an expected occurrence. It was not anything that seemed uh, to be reasonable. Yet the circumstances behind it and attending it and surrounding it made it almost inevitable. But at the time, no one could realize that this would be true. Muhammad himself, as a, as a character, as a person, has been subjected to perhaps more abuse than any other recognized world leader. I suppose there is no religious leader of a great surviving faith who has been more wholesalely and heartily insulted, or whose memory has been held up to as much condemnation and ridicule. We expect things like this to occur when a faith fails or when the leader is inadequate. But here we have the amazing situation of a great religion, a great faith that did not fail, but went forward to become one of the most powerful forces in the moral history of mankind. And yet the world has perhaps withheld its uh, approbation uh, in the matter of Muhammad more than in any other great leader 
whose leadership led to a successful termination. Yet actually these same critics and condemners have had so little to offer in the form of solid evidence. They have been unable to make Muhammad a bad man no matter how hard they tried. What they have therefore been content to do in most cases is to throw him into religious or theological perspective and declare, declare him to have been the Antichrist. And of course this type of thinking on the part of the West did nothing to improve East-West relationships in the Christian Islamic situation. In fact it laid such a miserable foundation that ultimately it had to lead to the Crusades as the next great cycle of the Phoenix 600 years later. Muhammad actually from all that we can learn about him, both from those who uh, held him in regard and those who would like to have condemned him, if they are fair people at all. We find a picture of a person intensely human and intensely real. We know, for example, uh, that he was born and raised in the midst of a country or of a culture which we call Sabianism. Sabianism was the pre-Islamic religion of the region. It was essentially star worship. It was the worship of natural forces. It contained a, con a considerable stratum of mysticism and perhaps can be compared uh, broadly to the Shintoism of Japan. It was a faith which centered in an ancient house of idols and old beliefs and that was the Kaaba at Mecca. This was a very ancient building, dedicated to many gods, and served by a priesthood for which Muhammad held the most intense suspicion. Muhammad, having been raised in this area, realized one thing that perhaps influenced his early life more than any other, namely that he was forced every day to watch priests exploit men this was one of the tremendous factors. Mecca was the center of the pilgrimage of an ancient people to the shrine of their gods. Mecca was also at that time little better than a city of organized banditry. The pilgrims who came there were beaten, robbed, and killed for whatever they had in their pockets. Uh, while it is not true that all of the Sabian priests were corrupt, they certainly were not able to control their people. And Mecca became uh, a town living off of the faith of men. The old, the weak, the crippled, and the dying went there for the blessing of their gods. And here they were profoundly exploited. Here they were uh, almost destroyed by people who claimed to have beliefs like their own. And Muhammad, a, apparently a very conscientious and very thoughtful man, stood by and watched this. He became convinced, as he tells us himself, that a great part of religion exists simply to exploit the ignorant superstition and essential goodness of human nature. Now, he probably would have found other faiths to say the same thing about if he had lived later. But in any event, this whole matter uh, was a real issue in the life of this man. After he was left orphaned, he was attached to the family and household of his uncle and became a caravan leader. He was the keeper or the manager of caravans. And he traveled with these, the strange and wonderful institutions, throughout the desert. He went to many strange and distant places. And on these long travels which he made, he stopped on numbers of occasions at little wayside uh, oases, tiny villages, where the Nestorian Christians had taken refuge. He found these hermits in the desert. He found that they were men who had been persecuted by their own. 
and who, unwilling to compromise their principles, had gone forth to seek a precarious existence in a wilderness. He found along the road the bones of those who had not completed the journey. He found little graves marked by rude crosses of those who had not survived long. And from these Nestorians and from the marketplaces where the caravans bartered their wares, he heard the story of the tragedy of the West. He definitely reports to us the things that he heard. Now, let us be fair about this. Let's not uh, uh, be too hasty in conclusion. We must remember that those he heard from were highly prejudiced. That they were the ones who were the heretics. They were the ones who had been cast out. They were the bitter ones. They were the ones who probably could find no good in anything that they had left behind. So let's be fair about it. Some of the stories were no doubt exaggerated. Just as nearly all stories uh, are colored, if the individual himself has suffered personally as a result of a circumstance. In any event, however, colored or uncolored, certain facts became generally knowable along the caravan route, which was the great gossiping exchange of the ancient world. People came from everywhere to sell some goods and talk a great deal. The caravan was a lonely, dangerous business, and the only reward was a pleasant conversation at the end. So Muhammad stopped with these priests and monks. He studied something of what they believed and what they knew. And one of the things he discovered early, of course, was that there were faiths other than the faith of Mecca. He discovered that men in other parts of the world had been searching for religion. He learned something of the old Jewish religion. He learned something of the heroic figure of Moses standing out against the background of that struggle. Later, through the Nestorians, he learned a great deal about the life of Jesus. And from the later writings found in the Koran, it is quite possible that he was uh, able to secure copies of early Christian writings. In any event, he heard the stories. He also heard the stories of the great councils. He, he learned of the feud which divided the Western and Eastern churches. He learned of the strange, pressurable tyranny with which the Western church was beginning to, or forcing its integration. He probably did not learn the struggle, the sorrow, the misery, uh, the misfortune uh, which the church also had to face. He did not realize that in an emergency man can only do what he can or what he believes to be right. These things he probably never knew. But at least he had the historical perspective of a dilemma, of a disaster. And he came to the conclusion in his own mind that the teachings that Jesus had left have been practically wiped out in less than 600 years. Whether he's right or not, we will not say, but that was what he believed. He believed that the Christianity that was then struggling for dominion of the Western Roman Empire had nothing in common with the original teachings of Jesus. He came to another rather prosaic but rather practical conclusion, namely that Jesus himself had used the wrong means. After all, uh, there are things to be considered that Jesus had not used sufficient force or strength in his own time to create a situation that could not so easily get out of line. He therefore believed that the early uh, the apostles and the early followers should have themselves integrated the faith and not left it uh, to future centuries to put together this broken pattern and try to build it into a consistency. That there were too many, in, uh, too many weaknesses in the structure itself. That these weaknesses should have been initially filled that philosophically, scientifically, religiously, psychologically, historically, all in all these brackets, Christianity should have been integrated in the beginning. He didn't know that he could do it, but he thought it should have been done. He went back to Mecca, and he was not converted to Christianity, nor was he converted to Judaism. He went back, and in the course of time, still watching, still observing, still meditating upon this, he followed a pattern that is not unusual in this type of leadership. He took upon himself the one-man task of trying to reform Mecca, and he found it a rather arduous procedure. 
He was all right until he began to interfere with the economic privileges of the merchants and other persons. And when he began to tell them that they should not perform these various evil actions, uh, which were so profitable, they then turned on him. In the meantime, however, Muhammad had strengthened his own, posi his own position tremendously. He had married a wealthy widow, a woman considerably older than himself. And by this one single stroke of fortune, he became a leading citizen. He became a big man in Mecca, the type of individual that others would bow to. He became also a rich man and became the master of many caravans. He arose then almost immediately to the estate of an aristocrat. One might have thought that this was the most serious temptation that this young man might have faced. If it was, he certainly did not fall under the temptation, for he continued to, here, to attempt his reforms, even though they endangered his own economic stability. Uh, one little episode is uh, preserved to us to indicate uh, the rather astute mind of this man who had been a camel driver. On one occasion, it was necessary to move, to, to restore part of the mill building, to remove the aerolite of Abraham from the corner of the Kaaba at Mecca. Now, the aerolite was a black stone, which is supposed to have fallen from heaven and to have been the pillar upon which Jacob rested his head at the time of the vision of the ladder. It was connected very much with Near Eastern thought and with the legends which had flowed in and out from the Judaistic uh, environs nearby. Though in Mecca, there were many great and powerful families, uh, most of them getting rich off of the pilgrims, as we have said. But each of these families claimed that it was the right of his family to move the stone in order that this sacred object should not be defiled. Well, the stone is about a foot square, and it was scarcely possible for all these individuals and their retinues to move the stone. It was not even possible for some to move it first and others to move it later because of the great importance of precedence. Anyone who was second in line lost caste, and that couldn't be done. So in their dilemma, for some reason, they called upon Mohammed, the new aristocrat, who undoubtedly had now the right also to get his finger on the stone if he could. Mohammed contemplated the matter for a while, and he said, I'll say, see how we'll do this. We'll take a very wonderful and rich and beautiful curtain, a fine piece of drapery, a rug, or something of that nature, a big one. We will lay the stone in the middle of the rug, and then all the different contendants can pick up some part of the corner of the rug or the side of the rug, and they can all carry it at once together. It was done, and a very serious situation was averted, which shows that Mohammed was an astute man in his own way, with a solution to a very difficult riddle. As time went on, it became evident to this man that he could not hope uh, to accomplish a one-man reform by attacking vice at its core. And here we must also pause and make mention of another thing, something that the critics have used against him and others have not known exactly how to orient, namely that Muhammad was not, not a man who could help. Early in life, he developed some kind of an ailment perhaps uh, a nervous ailment. His, em his enemies have said he was an epileptic. We are not at all certain that this was true, but that he was subject to some kind of an acute nervous disorder, which, stru which struck him almost like a stroke and uh, frequently caused him to fall unconscious. He was a man who apparently was suffering from some a serious internal problem which we have never been able to diagnose naturally after all this length of time. But between his worries, his fears, his anxieties, his scruples, and his basic his spiritual integrity, for the man definitely had it, he came to a more and more difficult situation until his wife became most deeply concerned for her husband. She saw that he was gradually breaking under some kind of a tremendous internal load, that a great frustration was slowly taking its toll upon his character. And she was the one, it is said, who inspired him and impelled him uh, to seek spiritual consolation for his problem. She recommended prayer. She recommended 
the way of old for those who had great struggle of soul that they should seek truth within themselves. And in a more or less accordance with her feelings on the matter, which perhaps perhaps coincided very closely with his own, Mohammed decided to perform religious vigil. And for many years he went annually to a mountain outside of Mecca, which is called Mount Hira, or the Mountain of the Light. And here, in a cave, he prayed that the original faith of mankind might be restored. The religion of the patriarchs, the religion that came before men broke up religions, the religion that would serve all men, the religion that was born out of the original spiritual hunger of humanity itself. And his prayers must be prayed more frequent the bitterness and sorrow in his heart became greater and his wife used to bring food and water to him as he remained day after day in these trances and in this cave on the side of Mount Hira. And at last, according to Muhammad himself, for when we come to this point, we have no other authority than himself, and have we more in the case of most other great teachers. Muhammad declared that in the midst of these vigils, in the great of his spirit and heart he was given an answer that in the midst of one of these lonely nights of prayer and agony a radiant figure appeared in the cave and stood before him and this was the figure of the angel Jeboreel or we call Gabriel and this strange and wonderful luminous figure held in its hand a scarf a long scarf which it spread out and held before Mohammed and on this scarf, written in letters of fire, were the first surahs or verses of the Koran. Muhammad bowed to the ground, fearful, not knowing what had happened. And then looking up pathetically, and we can almost imagine the pathos in the man at that moment, he looked at the radiant figure, and he said, O oh, great being, I cannot read. I can't read. I do not know what the figures say. And then it is said that the angel told him, reading for him word by word, and later bestowing upon him the power to read these figures even though he could not read other things. Later, incidentally, Muhammad did learn to read and write. But at this time he had not. He was only able to take the words of the being and the words that he read to him became the most important things in the world. After the passing of this vision, uh, the uh, young man, now not quite so young, but still before his prime, rushed down the hill again to his own home, and falling on his knees in front of his wife, told her the whole story, begging her to help him, begging her to answer one question for him. Was he deluded? Did this mean that he had merely, in the sickness of his own mind, created this himself? Was it possible that some evil spirit had come to deceive him? Could he believe these things? Was he mad? <clears throat> and he is said to have remained hours weeping in front of his wife. She didn't know what to do. The only thing she could do was to console him the best she could. And she said to him, you are a good man. You have always been honest. You have tried for a long time to make the city of your life a better place. You have never been selfish. You have never cheated anyone. You have never broken the laws of God or man as far as I know. Why should an evil spirit come to you? Why should this thing happen to you if you are not yourself selfish, if you have no pride, if you have no vanity, and if you come here weeping and ask me, why should you be deceived? What would it mean? Why could it happen? Well, Muhammad gained some courage from this, but he was still in a very terrible uncertainty. And it is said that a kind of madness affected him. And he wandered about. And one day, he said to himself, the decision is too great. I do not know. I'm an ignorant man. I do not know whether this be of God or the devil. 
I do not know whether I have the right to believe it. Supposing I do, and then I have been deceived, and a whole generation of men come after me and believe me, and they are all deceived. Am I creating, so going to create something that will destroy others? Am I going to found a false doctrine? How do I know? I have no way of knowing. So at last it is said that he went onto the side of a hill, and he said, I am not strong enough for this decision. I cannot live any longer because I do not know what to do. And he started to throw himself off the cliff. As he did so, this radiant figure appeared to him again, stopped him, and told him not to fear, not to worry, to be patient, and to just satisfy his own soul that what he was doing was right, not to pass it on to others until he found in himself that he was sure, but that he was not being injured by evil spirits, nor was he mad, and that he must have courage and wait. So Muhammad went back to his house and remained for some time simply waiting. He did not know what would happen next. Then by degrees this thing grew upon him. And instead of going out into the mountain, he found that at certain times this spirit came to him. And that when it came to him, he was in great physical pain. Uh, that he would seat himself or would fall and his servants had to pick him up and carry him to a couch. He said also that he frothed at the mouth and struggled and that his body was covered with sweat and that he even sweat blood. But when he awoke from these terrible experiences, he did not realize what he had gone through. But in many instances, he brought back with him fragments, more of these strange verses that he had seen first upon the scarf in the hands of Jeborio. These are these foundation elements of the faith of Islam. This is more or less the way it came into existence. It did not come into existence uh, as a splendid thing or as a great thing, but as the great pain and tribulation of a man striving for something and apparently called to a destiny. And as the faith began to take shape, as these verses began to uh, come more frequently, and they seem to be very beautiful, and they seem to be very wonderful, at least to him. He began to recite them to a few of his friends, and one or two men we knew who could read and write wrote them down. And uh, sometimes he would sit behind a curtain, and when these strange attacks came upon him, they would wrap him with cloths, and those who were secretaries would sit and listen and take down his words, and he would speak, and he would give these strange discourses, and um, by degrees in this way, uh, he attracted the attention of a small group. It must be said in his favor that his wife was his first convert, and next to that, the members of his own family, so that he did not uh, seek afar for support. It came directly to him. We cannot go into the whole life of Muhammad. I don't think it would serve our purpose, but we do know that throughout his life, we have brilliant expositions of his sincerity. Studying the Quran very carefully, we also observe a, a many changes in the man. He is not like any of the prophets uh, with which we are otherwise acquainted. His career did not unfold as theirs did. His career from beginning to end was an amazing mixture of a conviction in the reality of a mission and a very human an often inconsistent personal relationship with life. He was never uh, a person with so complete an understanding of his subject that he could carry it forward uh, with uh, unbroken continuity. Thus, for example, when political and social problems arose, we find the entire tone of the Koran changing, becoming more and more concerned with the immediate problems of the uh, religion which he was founding, the relig uh, immediate problems of his relationships with other faiths and other beliefs. He is constantly uh, re uh, revealing a kind of human reason, running in and around these inspiring things that happen to him. It's quite possible, therefore, that the Koran is a mixture of these various elements, some parts 
coming to him out of a very deep mystical communion and others arising almost from the emergencies of life around him. But throughout the whole period, the sincerity of the man seemingly remains unchanged. And we have several episodes of it. One where he's standing weeping over the grave of his son, Abraham. Uh, his faith was sorely tested on this occasion because he had to fight out the very simple, deep, and tremendous love of a father for his child uh, with his religion. He had to find the consolation of his faith in his own bereavement. And he was bereaved just as he says, I am a father bereaved, bereaved, I am no more. I am a father who has lost his son. And in this moment, I must find God myself as any other man would have to. And these types of thoughts are, are rather different from anything that we associate with the great revealed religions. On another occasion, while he was resting by the road, one of the soldiers of Mecca who has come to kill him stood over him with a drawn sword. Mohammed awoke. And the soldier said, And what will you do now? Who and whom will you take your faith? About to run his sword through Mohammed's body. Mohammed looked up at him, awakened suddenly from sleep, and said very quietly, I will take my refuge in the eternal God. The man dropped the sword and became a convert. On another occasion, when his little son was still alive and quite a small boy, a number of persons brought tribute uh, to the altars. And uh, the little boy, uh, seeing all these wonderful fruits that they gathered on the altar, ran over and grabbed a piece of fruit and started to eat it. The father went to him immediately, took the half-eaten fruit out of his mouth, and returned it to the altar and said, That which is given to God, no man shall touch. points out. Points out that as far as it's possible to judge, he was a man of extraordinarily humble and rather uh, frightened personality. Uh, as against this is the tremendous strength of the thing that he did. The uh, Hezra, which was the great flight of uh, Mohammed from Mecca to Medina, which had resulted in the saving of his life, because his enemies were determined to destroy him, is the beginning of the Muslim era. And all dates in the Muslim world are calculated A.H., or the year of the Hezra, rather than A.D., as we uh, count time. Muhammad's life, after the creation of his ministry and its development, centers very largely upon the principles of his faith, Principles which to him were so real and so prominent, promising and so valuable that no one would dare to question them. Probably there is no other monotheism in the world as strict or as austere as the faith of Islam. It was a faith based upon Mohammed's own famous statement, there is no God but God. He rejected totally the Trinitarianism of Christianity. He rejected totally the incarnation of God as Christ. He did not, however, reject Jesus. He declared Jesus to be the greatest of the prophets. And in the Koran he says that anyone who does not believe that Jesus, the son of Mary, was a prophet sent from God shall no way enter heaven. He believed in Jesus, but he believed also of Jesus as of himself that God has no sons except all men, that God has no personal children, but that God is able to move in the hearts of men so that some become his servants, and those who dedicate their lives totally to the service of God and are rewarded by the divine presence, they are the prophets. Muhammad said all prophets are human. All prophets are men reaching up to God. All prophets are teachers, but their flesh and their body is the same as the flesh of any other man. That some may gain great reputation and be remembered forever, because they have served men well. But no matter how great their reputation, 
regardless of the fact that future ages may deify them. There is only God and man, and all men are the servants of God. Therefore, all men are potentially prophets. All men have a tremendous possible mission. And those who answer the call of the Spirit in themselves, they are the ones who become the instruments of God's will. But regardless of this, these same human beings are not infallible, because through them also is their own humanity. And the man who may speak with the voice of God in one sentence may speak with his own voice in the next and not know which is which. Therefore, all men are mortal. If there is anything good in them, follow it. If there is anything bad in them, forgive it and pass on. This peculiar faith was so uh, dramatic in its way that it certainly had a tremendous effect upon the Near East. Politically and psychologically, there is nothing to indicate that Muhammad ever expected his religion to be more than a positive reform. He had come again in a strange way, not to destroy prophets, but to fulfill them. He accepted the prophets of the Old Testament. He accepted the teachings of Jesus. He recognized the ministry of the apostles. He believed that these were all great and good human beings serving God, and as such entitled to the enduring respect of all men. At last, at the head of a great company of people, he returned to Mecca bearing as his standard the green veil of his wife on a pole. He placed this in the court of the Kaaba, destroyed the ancient idols, and rededicated it to Allah, the one God. He then also redeemed or restated the old pilgrimage. He created at Mecca a new religious center. He cleaned the temple to the very best of his ability. He placed such rules upon the people of Mecca on a religious level that they could no longer exploit each other. He also then established the great pilgrimage to Mecca. And those who made the pilgrimage had a twist of green foil placed upon their turbans to indicate that they had gone to the holy city. Also, Muhammad made Jerusalem second only to Mecca as a center of religious worship. He continued his life his ministry, his death was ultimately uh, was uh, ultimately the result of poison. An effort was made to poison him. As he placed the cup to his lips, the hand of Jaboriel appeared and knocked it from his hand in the presence of a company of people. But he had already taken a very small amount of the contents of the cup, and it is said to have gradually killed him. He lived for several years in weakening health. The year before his death, he made the last great pilgrimage to Mecca on the Feast of Ramadan. This time he was too feeble to walk, and he rode upon a great black camel. At the head, it is said, of 60,000 of the faithful who went there to re-vow and re-dedicate themselves to the one God who is in heaven and earth and in the souls of men. And on this great black camel, he made his last speech, his last talk to his people. He told them he would not come back again. He told them that they were to remember always that as a man of themselves he had lived, and as a man he died, that he had no virtues beyond their own, that he was no more important than any one of them. There was only one thing important in all the world, and that was God. And there was only one way that men could serve God, and that was with truth. That know that these things alone were real and that they were never to glorify him, never to sanctify him, and he forbade that they should have a likeness of him in their world. No portrait, no likeness, no picture. They were to remember him only as a man of Mecca who had lived with them, worked with them, walked with them, died with them. These things, undoubtedly, to the Arabian mind, were tremendously important. And this very severe very just kind of faith built upon a triangular foundation undoubtedly partly Judaism partly Christianity and partly the peculiar synthesis accomplished within the consciousness of this man himself this faith had a tremendous lasting effect but what happened to it 
exactly the same thing that happened uh, in the church councils of early Christianity. Through the caliphs, through the development of the great descendants of the prophet, through his daughter Fatima, the entire faith fell again into the same strange mysteries of organization, the same strange struggle for temporal power, all of the factors. Carlyle tells us that in spite of all the lurid stories that we hear, it is doubtful if Muhammad ever held a sword in his hand. He did not uh, have a warlike nature. Also, he did not, as many believe, uh, take a very unpleasant attitude or a restricted Muslim attitude toward women. During his own day and for centuries thereafter, woman's state in Arabia was exactly equal to that of man. These things came in gradually, narrowing and restricting a belief through interpretation, perhaps even through false translation. Uh, those purposes which human beings themselves most desired to attain gradually took over until the simple faith of the man was lost in the confusion of the rise of a great creed. So we have this pattern dated at approximately the year 600. Now this pattern in itself had almost immediate re repercussions. In the first place, it became one of the bitterest situations that the rising Christian church in Europe had to face. Here was something uh, that to them was little better than a blasphemy. Not only were the creedal problems prominent, but here was another religion rising. A religion in a world which Christianity had believed to be dedicated to the cross. A powerful religion arising from the ashes of decadent faiths and threatening immediately the boundaries of Christendom itself. For this, from this moment on, Christianity in Europe had an enemy. Now this enemy, more or less originally self-created, but ultimately a very real and terrible adversary, this enemy did two things to Christianity. Like all adversity, it strengthened. It forced Christianity almost immediately to proceed in its own integration. It had to forget much. It had to mend broken bridges. It had to attempt to restore lost friendships. It had to take into account the great need for unity. This is exampled in the early rise of the Holy Roman Empire where the church, perhaps more in fear of rising Islam than any other equation, began the powerful problem, uh, faced the powerful problem of reorganizing its entire isolated position, fitting itself into a pattern involving a great deal more di diplomacy and government than had previously been intended. Islam also began to spread in other directions. Islam spread into and attacked the boundaries of the Byzantine or Eastern Empire. Islam moved into the Far East through the great passes of Afghanistan and Kaiba. It moved through the Valley of the Sindh in India. It reached not only into the innermost parts of India, but on past India into China. It reached downward into the Dutch East Indies. It reached into every part of Asia. Probably the only area that was not greatly affected by it was Japan. In this uh, tremendous outreaching, Islam in its spread began the consolidation of a great Muslim empire. A Muslim empire that remained until uh, the rise of such men as Akbar the Great. The Muslim empire which made possible the advent of Genghis Khan and Tamerlane or Timur Shah. Uh, an empire which bound together an area many times the size of Christianity and bound it together under one of the most powerful religious forces man has ever known. You may note that uh, not long ago there was an article in the paper about the uh, young heir to the lands, estates, and titles of the Aga Khan. Uh, this young man is, I believe, studying in America or was in England at one time, but he is studying in Western schools for the purpose of gradually taking over administration of a large body, many million Muslims. 
This young man is said to be most personable, a fine chap with a wonderful sense of humor and very modern, with many, many Western interests. He is in a Western college with friends of American, English, European background. He moves with them in complete uh, adjustment, and yet this young man will not take a drink because he is a Muslim. Now this type of thing is hard for us to understand perhaps, but a true Muslim will not. There has never been a, an alcohol problem in the real Muslim world. Why? Because it is prohibited by the Koran. Not long ago a traffic snarl in Hejaz, or what is now Saudi Arabia. No one knew who was right. The policeman came along, listened to all the stories, took out the Koran, and solved the problem. Everything moves from the Koran. If you do not know what to do, read the Koran. And if it isn't in the Koran, don't do anything. But one thing, you must never go against it. And that is as true today as it was 1400 years ago. So the tremendous power and integrity of this faith in the lives of its people, we cannot say has produced in all cases an admirable people, but it has produced a very strong, united attitude by means of which uh, the moral influence of Islam is far greater than its political. Islam, unlike Christianity, has never had a central church. Islam has never had a, its equivalent of a pope, nor has it ever had its equivalent of a college of cardinals. It has had nothing of this kind. Your Islamite is ruled by the descent of the caliphate. It is ruled by families tracing their descendants from the prophet. And as the only surviving heir of the prophet was his daughter, they all descend from the descent of Fatima. Uh, this, fam this family descent produces a number of rulers ruling over Muslim states. It was the secret of the authority of the Aga Khan. He was a direct descendant of the Prophet. All the descendants of the Prophet, therefore, have a kind of priestly influence of their own, ruling their own sects, ruling groups and schools. But these themselves, these leaders, never find it necessary, or never have, to have any powerful religious political structure. Therefore, in Islam, there is no such a thing as one moving political power. Efforts have been made to synchronize Islam and synthesize its factions by what has been called the rise of pan-Islamism or the pan-Islamic movement, but it has taken very few roots. The Muslim remains an individualist. The Muslim priest is also quite different from our concept of a priest because he is not actually a priest at all. The Muslim priest is a teacher. He is more of what we would call a schoolmaster. He performs certain religious functions, but his essential reason for existence is the instruction of the young. Therefore, the school in Islam was on the steps of the mosque. And here, reading, writing, and arithmetic were taught by the so-called priest. He calls the faithful to prayer. He may lead them in prayer. He may read certain verses of the Quran, but it's always to be remembered in Islam that it is the believer himself who is the priest. If the believer himself is not sincere, no priest can save him. If the believer himself is not sanctified, no ritual, no sacrament can sanctify him. Everything must happen within himself. He must spread the rug of prayer, and when he gets upon it, it means that he leaves this world and enters into a sanctuary, the sanctuary of his own life. He then faces Mecca, the great seat of his faith, the great center of his belief, and he recites his eternal prayer, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, there is no God but God. This situation has importance to us today, and it also had very great importance at the time which we mentioned, because it resulted almost immediately in the integration of a great policy in Europe. From the date of the life of Muhammad, 
from the rise of the immediate caliphs after Muhammad, we see Europe suddenly taking stock of itself. Europe had passed through many uh, important changes. It had seen the Roman Empire collapse, and now it looked for a moment at least as though it was going to see the Holy Roman Empire collapse. It was seeing a tremendously vital faith, a faith moved by the most amazing strength of the desert, and this faith growing, gathering like a whirlwind beyond the ramparts of Gog and Magog, and threatening to inundate Europe like a tidal wave. It is quite probable, although uh, most historians have only intimated it, it is most probable that the thing that brought Europe out of its own doldrums was Islam. Not because Europe was interested or delighted, but because Europe saw handwriting on the wall of the desert. Europe realized the fact that it was faced with something that was, was going to require a lot of thinking. And several interesting points uh, present themselves as comparison when we begin studying this situation. We find in the rising power of Islam a tremendous rise of culture. Within a very short time, the faith of Islam was in the keeping of perhaps the most brilliant group that existed west of deep Asia. The caliphs of Baghdad, the great leaders of the Muslim movements, gathered around themselves magnificent courts. They created a tremendous civilization, a civilization of intangibles, but very real values. Theirs was a civilization of philosophy, of science, of poetry, of music, and of art, and the most skillful and wonderful of crafts. Because of the peculiar quoting of their scripture, for instance, the Muslim world was free from something that laid a heavy hand upon Europe, and that was the restriction upon learning and the danger that the Western European was constantly fearing that he was going to fall into religious heresy. The Muslim never had this. The Muslim could study Plato or study Aristotle or anything of that kind without any qualm of conscience at all, because he was not under the strange orthodoxy that held Christendom in its grasp for centuries. Thus the Muslim expanded, he grew, but most of all he became a highly civilized person. And we were not to find that out for a long while, and most of Europe did not know it until the Crusades. But there was rising a golden empire of attainments. And in this empire was supported progress in Europe for centuries, for it was the return of the golden empire of classical learning to Europe through the later founding of the Moorish universities in Spain under Muslim control that Europe finally came out of the Dark Ages and entered into the more luminous period which we call the Renaissance. Now it's interesting to realize for a moment even how this happened. When the Moorish universities, which were Islam Islamic and which stemmed in part at least from the Holy House of Cairo, uh, when uh, these universities were opened in Spain, what we do we learn? We learn that scholars of every belief went to them. We find the Christian scholar, the Jewish scholar, the Muslim scholar studying side by side. The Muslim never restricted learning to his own sect. He opened it to anyone who wanted it. To him, reading, writing, and arithmetic were not matters of religion. They were matters of common need and all men were entitled to them equally. The uh, Muslims did a great deal in algebra and in optics. And they gave us many choice formulas. They gave us many secrets of medicine long lost. They opened the way for the rise of humanism in Europe. And they gradually transformed European education. But we find that the graduates, the European graduates of the Muslim colleges in Spain went back to Europe and there at the Sapienza and in the great universities of Europe they had the chairs of authority. So a tremendous bridge was built 
all the time behind the surface of great antagonism. And yet Europe needed what the Muslim had so badly, Europe had to accept it. All this is a, a bar involved situation, but out of it we see several things gradually emerging. We see the political restoration of Europe gradually in its union against the danger of a rising Muslim world. We find the infiltration of Muslimism into nearly all other parts of Asia. We find also another interesting thing, namely that Muslim schools, Muslim universities, Muslim communities also became the refuges for two kinds of people. One persecuted heretical Christians and second persecuted Jewish scholars. The, the Jewish scholar found his refuge in Baghdad and among the Muslim states. He was able to pursue his cultural life and pursue his studies of medicine and science which greatly concerned him at this period. He also found the only tolerant area in Europe, in Spain, where he was able to advance his educational processes until Alfonso of Castile, gradually coming into possession and, and overthrowing the Muslim schools, began the process of exiling Jewish scholars. But for centuries, the Jewish scholar also was able to gain a broader education and to advance his learning. All these factors played their parts. Muslimism, furthermore, became a bridge between the e Far East and Europe. It's one thing that has always happened with mankind. Regardless of how much he dislikes anyone, he will do business with him. Business is entirely outside of the province of your prejudices. Europe was in desperate need of products, or thought it was at least, which were available only along the caravan routes from the Muslim world, through Samarkand and through all these areas of the Near East. It was from the Near East, therefore, that the caravans from the Far East finally reached Europe, and goods and communication from Europe finally reached Asia. So Muslimism, seated at the crossroads of the world, of the then existing known world, uh, was in a most fortuitous condition. It could control and regulate for its own advantage practically all the traffic between Asia and Europe. And this traffic was much heavier than we realize. It was along these routes that paper came, the game enabling us to follow the Eastern habit and practice of books. It was from these same uh, traffic routes also later the secret of printing came finally to be rediscovered by Gutenberg. All these trade routes also had much to do with the common knowledge of scholars. Uh, in the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries, Chinese scholars penetrated all the way to Europe along the trade routes. And we have far better understanding of international relationships as a result of this than people generally realize. Unfortunately, however, the understanding was limited to a few families, to a few persons who were in position to receive or secure this information. The general public, of course, at that time was abysmally ignorant. Thus, in this great cycle of the Phoenix, we see the challenges that were to affect a great many things. Strangely enough, when the bird spread his wing again, we had a new religion a powerful one, springing up as Muhammad himself originally intended it to be, as a censoring force upon Christianity. It was almost certain that Muhammad hoped, although never perhaps was certain, that his faith would help people uh, to reevaluate Christianity in the light of working together for one God and forgetting creeds. That was the thing he was working for. Of course, he did not succeed in this, but he did produce the adversary who was so real and so increasing in power that men had to take it seriously. And thus, uh, we find then a gradual change in the total picture of European thought. And the Dark Ages began to move into what we term the medieval world. 
And the medieval world was the direct result of the impact of decadent Europe and the Near East. Now what is the difference between the Dark Ages and the medieval world? Today, most historians prefer to refer to the whole period as the medieval world, extending from the 5th to about the 12th centuries. They like to only consider the term Dark Ages as relatively applied to the critical turning point at the beginning of this period. By the medieval world, they understand uh, the world of the gradual building of European institutions. Up to the collapse of the Roman Empire, uh, Rome had been a single powerful unit and had gradually captured, colonized, and formed into uh, various kinds of semi-autonomous groups, the nations that paid tribute to Rome. Now the process of the gradual integration of nations began to take place. The rise during the medieval world was the rise of societies, of what we would term petty states. And the great product of the medieval period was what we call feudalism. Now feudalism uh, was the return of local government from Rome uh, to various petty princes, nobles, squires and so on, who were liberated from Rome, they set themselves up as crested and liberated gentry built themselves castles, so uh, became proprietors of the lands around these castles, lived off of the taxes which they collected from the land allotments of their tenants, and slowly developed into what we term aristocracy. Now there were good things and there were bad things about this. The first thing is something had to happen, so it had to follow some line of least resistance. The Romans had placed puppets, or had variously influenced local persons to be sort of quislings for the Roman purposes in these distant regions. These puppets in some cases were able to maintain themselves, take over and become the early feudal rulers. Others were overcome by more ambitious associates new lines were established. But little by little, Europe developed into a mass of these small feudal units. Uh, some of them cut through language, although language became one of the few barriers that separated them. They were also with one common denominator. All these little feudal lords held their authority by the grace of God. They were all united in religion and uh, were to a measure at least held in check by the fear of religious retaliation. Most of these uh, feudal princes and lords had their theological advisors and these tried to keep them in line and many times did so. And the general tone of this religious advice was generally good, generally inclined for fairness or toward clemency or leniency on all matters other than theological. So these petty princes began to form a powerful group and the Middle Ages really is the story of the struggle of these various rulers, sometimes in subterfuge, sometimes in war. Out of this also rose another situation which we refer to as the Age of Chivalry. And the age of chivalry, again, was a revolt against feudalism. The age of chivalry uh, was the recognition of the dawn of a common rulership. The age of chivalry uh, was a kind of over-religion, a religion attempting to correct the faults of theology. Feudalism continued until these various feudal princes became highly decadent. So the story of feudalism extends through that cycle of the phoenix which extends from the 6th to the 12th century. And after the 12th century, feudalism was stricken with a mortal blow from which it never recovered. In other words, 
uh, men becoming free of Rome, becoming free, period. These men began to abuse freedom. The rights that had been gained to individual peoples by the collapse of the Roman colonial program, program these rights began to be abused. Little by little, freedom became the right of license. By degrees, the individual, increasing in selfishness, lost sight of the essential values of human life. These feudal princes and lords were too ignorant even to know what was going on in the world around them, with the exception of a few outstanding examples. They lived only uh, to exploit, by degrees, uh, their tenants. Uh, under some conditions, taxation reached such points that the tenants themselves could no longer survive. Also, this system meant that there could be no unification in Europe. Each one of these knights, sitting in his castle on the top of a hill with his retainers, was a power unto himself. He could not be forced to do anything. He would not sacrifice any of his own rights. He would not cooperate, and it was at this time that began the great cycle of suspicion which has divided Europe ever since. No man trusted anyone. There was no probability or possibility of any common relationship. You could not even get roads. There was no communication that was valid. Practically all communication simply consisted of the personal runners of these knights. The only road that ever led away from a feudal castle led to Rome. There was practically no other uh, perspective. Rome was a kind of hub, and this vast feudalism moved around it. The feudalism was not good for Rome. It was not good for the feudal lords themselves, nor for their peoples. Yet it arose as the direct result of man's first massive abuse of freedom. He had received it too soon. The overseer had departed, but had left an ignorant man behind him, incapable of governing his own destiny. This, of course, led, as it would naturally do, uh, to a series of moves, of brilliant moves, but of highly selfish ones. Those feudal groups, more powerful than others, began to move in upon their neighbors. By degrees, the smaller and weaker were crushed out. And by degrees, the domains of the greater families increased. This meant that also during this period, Europe gradually changed into a series of family rulerships which would become or were to be the beginning of the monastic, uh, not monastic, but monarchical concept. Gradually the little principalities were absorbed and out of them all came finally a handful, less than fifty perhaps, great families. Families with deep and some of them rather terrible reputations, like the Borgia and the Medici. These families became the virtual dictators of the earth, as far as Europe was concerned. And beneath the surface of this procedure, the state of man was growing worse and worse and worse. This condition could only again lead uh, to ultimate violence. But here we have a pattern that was to revive itself again in another cycle later. The coming together of these feudal lords into the formation of great families began to develop a psychology which uh, developed as early as the sixth century and has continued in some places even to the present time. But today we are also beginning to recognize the danger of this pattern, although we have believed it ourselves until very recently because these old ideas do not die easily. The only one who can get over them quickly is the astute historian, who, seeing what they did before, hopes he will never live to see it happen again. But the point that I mean is this. Out of this entire procedure rose the first rugged individualism. During the great glory of the feudal system, we have no evidence whatsoever 
that human beings accepted any responsibility for the well-being of each other. That is an almost unbelievable condition. The first rise against that was the orders of chivalry. It was the, uh, the concept of chivalry, probably created by secret societies, it was the first to break through this. And the struggle of chivalry against it has given us the Arthurian cycle and many of the great literary epics, which are somewhat date, uh, later in their date than the stories which they describe. Because uh, early these stories were based upon previous legendary. But actually, uh, in Europe at that time, there was no concept of mutual responsibility. Uh, there was no consciousness of the relationship of events. The Middle Ages were the Middle Ages because they were totally without historical perspective. Nobody believed that anything that happened was due to any reason nor would any inevitable consequence result from anything he did. One of his troubles, of course, was that he had gotten himself completely out of the picture. And fate, destiny, deity had taken over all the aspects of human morality. If a man dropped dead, it was by the grace of God, not because he had eaten something that made him sick. If he didn't have a friend, it was because God was punishing it, not because he'd never earned a friend. If a plague swept through a great community, it was the work of the Lord, and no one thought of hygiene or sanitation. If a man declared war, regardless of whether his cause was right or wrong, it was by the grace of God. And the underlings had to just simply go out and die. There was no concept that individuals had to work together or that the building of a civilization depended upon perspective. No one at that time thought of sacrificing his own little feudal castle to build a better world or sacrificing any part of it. He had no sense of a different world. Now there were several reasons why he didn't. One of these reasons was the plague. And the plague was such an extraordinary factor that it cut through every equation of man. One visit of the bubonic plague in Europe resulted in 29 million deaths. The deaths were so terrible and so constant uh, that the Pope blessed the waters of the River Seine in France so that the sanctified dead could be buried by being thrown into the river because there was no longer any place in the cemeteries for them. Also, in the cemeteries of Paris, due to the number of bodies put in, the level of the cemetery ground rose 20 feet in one year. On some of the smaller islands, such as, for example, the island of Malta, in one of the epidemics it is said that not one human being was left alive. This situation, psychologically, was completely demoralizing. And the plague struck Europe at least nine times with tremendous devastation, some of the attacks being only five or ten years apart. This was completely uh, a factor with which no man at that time could conceive that he could reckon. Therefore, no man could plan. No man could purpose anything. Here today, gone tomorrow. He never knew why and he never knew when. And if the plague didn't get him, the feudal lord would send him off to some remote place to fight and die. So there was no integration, no purpose behind the pattern of life. The second thing was, was that it was generally assumed at that time, theologically, that the world would end before the 12th century. Therefore, if the second coming, the end of the world, were to occur, perhaps even in your own lifetime, and you believed this completely, you could see that there would be very little probability of social planning. It just didn't occur. There was no reason for it. Everything was in the hands of fate and destiny. Everything was completely apart from man. All he could do was serve and die. There was no possible thought that he should leave much to his children, for he had nothing to leave them. 
even assuming that he did leave them something, he might very well find that they would predecease him. There was no reason to make better ground or plant a better harvest because the man up in the castle on the hill took it away from you anyway. The whole thing settled down and we have the record definitely that Europe passed for centuries to what might be termed a collective hopelessness. Now you might say that the feudal lord was in a pretty fortunate position at this time, but he wasn't. Actually, he had no more perspective than the people, because the only way in which you can have perspective is to be better, and he was no better. He was not really a bad man. He was stupid, and so were the people, and there was no cure. There were no schools for him to go to. He lived alone, his principal sports were hunting and war. He had no reason to believe that war meant anything. He wasn't fighting for anything except to hold on to what he had. He had no reason uh, to expect loyalty except that the bishop or the priest had taught that obedience to the Lord of the castle was second only to obedience to the Lord of heaven. The bishop didn't know any better. He wasn't a selfish, bad man. It was simply a locked world, a world of illiterates, a world of people who had suddenly gotten into a situation much too large for them. And the growing pains, which we call the Middle Ages or the medieval period, were certainly painful to everyone involved, the rich and the poor alike. The Doge of Venice was just as likely to die of smallpox as the poorest farmer. In fact, he usually was the first to go. Because the man on the farm lived close to the earth and certain natural sanitation protected him. The man in the castle on the hill was in much worse condition from the standpoint of sanitation. Even as late as Queen Elizabeth of England, Elizabeth I, the Queen herself made a tremendous stir in London when she declared that regardless of heaven or hell, scriptures or authority, she was going to take a bath once a year. <laughs> For hundreds of years, people were told that to take a bath was to get the plague. You can see how such a situation would fit rather tight and would also prevent uh, any directing of progress with this also was this terrible fear that if the common man had nothing to hope for and perhaps was too ignorant to have any integrated fear, the, the few leaders who did have a little background knew two things as one or two of them preserved for us in historical records. First, they realized how little they could depend upon ignorant followers. That was a serious situation in itself. A leader is no stronger than his followers. And where he is dealing with a group of people completely unlettered, unlearned, and highly superstitious, he is not in a safe position. On the other hand, his broader experience whispered to him that Islam was right around the corner. And he sat very uneasily upon his higher seat. All this elevation uh, permitted him to do was to see his dangers a little more readily. So he had worries that the common man never knew, but they were worries just the same. To meet this situation with its tremendous neurosis, you can see why something else would occur. You could see why the mind of Europe would slowly go into what you might term a complete psychoneurotic condition. And it was the psychoneurosis of the European mind that gave rise to another horrible situation that grew. And that was demonism. Now, we don't have any idea today what demonology did to Europe. We have a little taste of what it did in the Salem witchcraft scare in this country. But that was an isolated incident, and common sense very soon came to the assistance of everyone involved. In a few years, the situation was cleared up. But in Europe, we had 500 years of demonism. We had 500 years of people who didn't dare to go out of the house at night. People who firmly believed that the devil was under every pew in church, even while they were praying. A people who believed their neighbors went up the chimney on broomsticks. 
a people who firmly believed that thousands of their so-called honest fellow citizens rode on broomsticks to the Bracken to celebrate the Sabbath and to dance in frenzy around the strange, grotesque figure of the Goat of Mendes. Now this was a cheerful situation, but what did it do? It made every person afraid of his neighbor. It made people so frightened that when Dr. Old Dr. Faust had a dog that could stand on his hind legs, he was accused of being a witch or a sorcerer. And a dog that would answer when his master whistled was a devil in disguise. You couldn't even have a dog that answered when you whistled. Cows, rats, cats, and everything else brought into court and tried for heresy. Horses burned at the stake. And if you don't believe that hysteria of this kind could do things, see what happens in a lynching in the South today. So-called respectable, honorable citizens lose their minds temporarily. And in Europe, remember at that time, men didn't have much mind to lose. And it went easily and quickly. We had millions of persons murdered, executed, tortured to death for this terrible fear we had the malus maleficarum, the hammer of evil, which like the mallet in the hands of a justice or a chairman, came down with a blow every time a man was condemned to death. And they say that mallet fell by the hour. Dead simply because his neighbor had a cow go dry. Dead because he was born cross-eyed dead because of some old deserted forlorn person he had gone out into the forest near the edge of a village built a little hut and maybe gave people a few herbs this for this he would be quite quickly died uh, killed tortured brought to the stake for a horrible crime and of course under torture confessing anything because he couldn't stand the pain so this situation moved over this whole area it's still there today in the Balkans but this situation and all the others pressing in gave us what I like to think of as the medieval world a world which had to come to an end a world in which crises developed from a hopeful 6th century to a hopeless 12th and outside of the range of this European happening in other areas the rising of brilliant civilizations civilizations which Europe gradually became aware of civilizations which Europe had to copy had to bring back and restore all these things that had been lost and so the, the great hope, perhaps combining the hope for the rise of a Christian empire in Europe and the hope of a great reform in Asia through the rise of the Muslim empire, this hope grew strong. But by the 12th century, 600 years later exactly, both hopes had become forlorn. Both situations were again out of hand. And it remained essential that another great driving power be delivered a new force would come into existence now this force card dates perfectly with the transition that began what we might term the beginning of the modern world and in the 12th century all of these scattered inconsistent elements in which there was much of good much of hope and much of sorrow uh, wisdom flowing from the great Muslim colleges <coughs> Buddhism spreading into China in northern Asia bringing its message of brotherhood Christianity beginning to create its mysticism for mysticism became the great remedy uh, for this tremendous pressure because after all Christendom consisted only of these same people it wasn't a different people running them they were the same people and these people were beginning to recognize whether layman or member of monastic order 
that there was now only one hope, and that was to turn in again, to turn into self in the great need of the consolation that only uh, understanding of self could bring. Then we had the great dance macabre, the dance of death. We had the great cycles of penance. Men began to fear as they had never feared before. They feared for their own souls. They feared for everything. They believed finally that their whole world, the whole of Europe, was drenched in sin. It wasn't drenched in sin. It was simply drowning in ignorance. But they did not know the difference. They were not bad because they didn't know how to be good. They were just caught in a pattern that nothing seemed to break. And so over the mountains of Italy, France, Germany, and the Low Countries, over the landscape came these great processions. Processions of weeping, crying people. Hundreds of thousands moving every day. Processions the like of which we can have no concept. Women with babies clinging to their breasts, wandering along in the snow, falling dead, and wrapping the child to the end with their own bodies before they both froze. The roads such as they were of Europe, red with blood from morning till night, from the feet of those wandering, wandering. Not because they had no homes, but because they had left everything from fear. Fear of sin. The sudden belief that the world was going to end and that all mankind was going to fall into perdition. Hell was going to swallow up Europe because Europe had sinned. And so we have the great processions of the flagellants, the penitents. We have the great sad mourn of the misericordia, the great howling breaking of people. We find the prisons opened the convicts coming out to strip themselves and beat their bodies, prince and commoner, queen and servant, walking barefoot in the snow, repenting their sins. So you can see that things were getting in pretty bad shape. And most historians have forgotten these things. But they lead inevitably from the great hope, the hope of Christendom, that the Christian Roman Empire would rise from the ashes of the Caesars, a phoenix. The great hope of Arabia, that the teachings of Muhammad would bring men back to God. The great hope of Asia, that education would save men. The great hope of our Western primitive empire, that men could live together in brotherhood and peace in the Maya states. All these hopes gradually declining to declining in the western hemisphere, where upon the ruins of the old Mayan temples the warlike Toltecs built their shrines. Every case, this great hope ending in darkness, ending in fear and doubt, and then at the critical moment, again the resurrection of hope, the rising of the phoenix of human hope from the ashes of its own death in the brilliant burst of light that marked the 12th century. And that is the century we would talk about next week.